All right, so today I wanna break down the short documentary that I filmed called Growing Culture, where I partnered with Masa Seed Foundation to tell their story. Really cool project, really cool people. So I hope you can check that out. Um, if you haven't seen it, you can check it out here. Um, but first, I wanna play the intro and then we'll get right into the breakdown. Culture is such a big word in farming. Agriculture, permaculture, horticulture, tissue culture, everything culture, and then people culture of all kinds. I said to the king. Yeah. All right, enjoy. All right, be careful. You're cultivating. Cultivating the earth, which is the very ground we walk on, and you're cultivating the earth to feed people? And to feed yourself, to work out your stuff. You, you got to get away from it because you got to hit it over the top again. Uh, about getting the word across or the feeling is bringing people closer to the fact that when we are doing farming, an interesting thing. You're building culture. So, how did I get connected? with Masa in the first place. Well, one, I had an interest in some sort of documentary for agriculture. I think it's interesting where our food comes from and how that process occurs, and especially with seeds and locally adapted seeds is very interesting. So I actually connected with Zero Foodprint, found them online, it was a nonprofit, and they connected me with a local farm, and that's Masa Seed Foundation, as you see in the video. I connected with them and in the pre-production process, we had uh, a short meeting where I connected with Laura and Rich and we drew up a game plan of what we wanted to cover and what we wanted to highlight. So in that pre-production meeting, I had to be really attentive to what angle I was gonna approach this and how I wanted to tell the story. So the game plan was to film over two days, one to sort of get introduced to their farm and then the second day to get some more B-roll and then shoot the interview. The camera lenses I use was the Blackmagic Pocket 6K and then the Mikey full frame, both the 50 and the 35. They're just great cine lenses. To be honest, obviously gear matters, but then at the end of the day, what matters to me is some sort of unit that I know I can use really well. So day one started super early in the morning. I think I left my house at like 545 and then we got there at seven. Uh, their farm is in Boulder, Colorado. I live down south, so I had to drive up there. If I started later in the day, we'd have this high noon, bright, high key lights, but starting early was crucial to getting some good light in the first couple of hours of the day. So as far as lighting goes, nearly everything was all natural lit. And I kind of like that style of lighting because you don't have to worry about bringing your lights, your stands, and really have to work with your natural key light, the sun, to make it work for you. I think one of the main challenges uh, that I'm learning in this process is you don't need as much B-roll as you think. A lot of times we're trying to capture the best shots, the most B-roll, and there's tons of footage that I have from this project that I didn't use. What's more important is telling the story and building out scenes within your documentary, capturing moments that tell the story of the farm or of the characters that we're talking about instead of just capturing really cool composition, slow motion shots, but being in the moment, being cognizant of what's going on and how to sort of exploit a certain scene or story to tell that later in the documentary. The day that I showed up was actually harvest day. So they were uh, getting all the produce in, uh, had cucumbers, squash, kale, lettuce, all sorts of stuff. So you wanna make sure if you're shooting a documentary about a subject that you're not as familiar with, really uh, do your research or ask them, what's a really good day that we could shoot with you? Or is there something interesting to capture on camera? Let's do that. So when you have a talking head interview and you include that with an interesting action, the result is always good attention with your audience. But when you're doing something at such a high stake level in such a fast paced environment, don't try to include something new that you don't know much about especially with gear. Try to stay tried and true to the system you have. And if you're not comfortable yet, you gotta get out there and practice. So on day two, I showed up on the second half of the day, which is kind of cool because you're gonna get a lot of different lighting situations as opposed to the morning. So the farm looks almost entirely different. The lighting, the shading, everything. The other thing, I was getting some more B-roll from the farmer's market that they had and capturing anything that I didn't get from the previous day. So in the interview, I set up my main Godox light on Rich 
and tried to balance the exposure a bit from the ambient light of the sun, the backlight, and then just find a really good scene. Here he's sitting in front of the mountains, kind of also in the greenhouse. So we had a little bit of diffusion around him and then adding that extra light as some fill. And then in post doing the grade, kind of vignetting him a little bit and raising up the levels on his face. So lastly, with the edit, which really that's where the documentary is made, right? I first started with the interviews. I had to chisel out the story. So I cut down Rich's interview, which was the main bulk of it, and then Laura's interview. I like to have my interviews in a separate timeline and then save different versions of that, the longest version of it, and then cut down from that. And I save it in different sections within that timeline. Then I move the interview to the main timeline and then get to editing. Usually that's like the backbone, the plain Jane version of the video is just the interview. And then I begin to build some music on top of that. So I use Musicbed and curated a playlist that was more acoustic, cinematic, ambient uh, to really get that vibe across. Now, of course, the intro to me in the documentary is really important, especially for a short doc, because you wanna pull in the audience. As we get going in the intro after that, you want a nice break. It's almost like the more I edit uh, videos, you're really like a musical conductor. You're setting a tone and a pace. Like if you had a, a, you know, a crescendo all the way throughout your musical piece, it gets mundane and monotonous. And although that's like the coolest part, it's the climax, that crescendo part, if you're always playing that part, then your audience is gonna tune out. So you gotta have the ebbs and the flows, the, the louds and the quiets. So that's what I really wanted to do here. I didn't wanna saturate the whole timeline with music. I wanted to allow the audience to feel like they're on the farm. So it's quite messy at first. And I trust that the wind will separate all that champ. Hardest part about editing, especially if it's a project you're passionate about and you really obsess over or you're really into, is being able to scale back and just watch it like you're watching it for the first time. It's always good to stay sensitive to your edit and not to lose the bigger picture. I think the key is finding the voice of the story. And I found that first with knowing that, okay, this is a story about farming seed, about seed adaptation and growing locally regionalized seeds and why it's important to get involved. So I found that early on and then everything stems from that. Every edit is gonna have some sort of angle that draws back to that central theme. And that's important. Identify the theme and then exploit that through the rest of your story. So that's it for me today. If you wanna see the full documentary, you can watch that here. Or if you wanna see more behind the scenes breakdowns, you can watch uh, one we filmed at a ceramic studio. You can watch that here. But that about wraps it up. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.